My name is Thomas Prano. I'm a respiratory therapist and I'm the clinical educator for respiratory therapy services at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton, Ontario. So the first part of this is going to be a, an overview because most of you have been introduced to the device. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things. So these are all of the typical things we use for monitoring at the bedside. Things that are continuous are vent parameters, lung mechanics like compliance, oximetry, capnography. If we have it in line, we have volumetric capnography. All of these things are done at the bedside. Blood gases are not continuous, but we can access them at any time if someone has an arterial line. So in terms of the non-invasive of them, most of them are partially invasive, meaning we have to have an endotracheal tube in the patient. Um, oximetry is not obviously non-invasive. However, capnography, again, it has to be in line with a, an endotracheal tube. And blood gases, of course, you're either poking or you have an in indwelling catheter. All of them, however, are radiation free. Every single one of these gives us a global picture of the patient. So we just know that something's wrong, but we don't know where something's wrong. So if someone's SATs dropped, we don't know if it's a right middle lobe collapse. When we do an x-ray and we see a full left whiteout or a full right whiteout, that tells us where the problem is. But at the bedside, we have no idea with these numbers. So if we want to get regional information, we have to do a CT scan or a chest x-ray. And of course, chest x-ray can be done at the bedside. CT scan, we have to go on a bit of a trip as Dave knows. So the reason why we want regional monitoring is because you can actually say, okay, well, my dorsal regions are not so good, or my right side is worse than my left, my left is bad, or my right. So we can get these regional idea, this regional idea of where our problems are occurring in the lungs. And of course, a chest x-ray gives us similar information where we can say, okay, well, we have you know, bilateral infiltrates, or we have the patient looks wet. We can make comments on x-rays. <clears throat> in terms of regional changes that are going on or if they're changing or getting better. And what the Palma Vista device that we have does is gives us regional information. It is continuous, it's at the bedside, it's non-invasive and it's radiation free, which that's the only difference between the CT scan and the chest x-ray between these um, regional devices. So one of the things that we've actually been able to do at the bedside with our patients that are not breathing spontaneously is assessing whether or not when we apply higher pressures to ventilate them, to try and recruit them, whether or not they open up or whether they don't. So if they're a recruiter or a non-recruiter. So this is a patient on five centimeters of water and 45, and notice how there's, there's no difference. So this person recruitment maneuvers are doing nothing. In this patient, five versus 45, you can see that there is actually recruitment. This is recruiter versus non-recruiter. You also have recruitment potential. So some people will recruit a lot, a little bit, or not at all. So there's different varying degrees of it. And we don't really know what, we're, if we're just recruiting at the bedside, we don't know whether or not they're actually popping anything open. Because if the sats drop when you're doing a recruitment maneuver, that actually usually happens when areas of lung pop open that haven't been ventilated or perfused for a while. So your sats going down is usually an, not an indication that they're not recruiting. It's when your blood pressure goes down that you start to worry about it. So you shouldn't stop a recruitment maneuver if sats start to drop. This is why most guidelines in terms of studies say recruit on 100%. And some people say, well, if I put them on 100%, it's going to make it look like the recruitment maneuver is working. It's like, actually, if the recruitment maneuver works, you may desaturate. So this is to try and prevent that desaturation. That's why we should do it on 100%. It was usually, it was a confusing thing with the oscillate trial. Members like, why are we putting up to 100 during recruitment? That's why, because if lungs do start to recruit, usually the SAS will drop. So you put them on 100 and then you watch your blood pressure. Make sure that that stays stable. One of the studies that <clears throat> I like to reference when I talk about recruitment pressures, and this is why our policy, we use that pressure control style recruitment that will we'll go all the way up to 50, is that less than 50% in, in this study, so they looked at 24 patients doing a, an aggressive form of recruitment maneuver, less than half of them actually recruited with a pressure of 40. And then you can see between 10 and 20% recruited with pressures of 45. Around close to 10% needed 50 centimeters of water. More than that required 55. And again, back up to about 15% of patients only recruited when they reached 60 centimeters of water. We don't go higher than this in our policy. Two patients that did get pneumos were in this range. Uh, now they developed the pneumos days later, but maybe there was some injury done during the maneuver that just caught up with them a couple days later. It's hard to tell. We can't say it was cause and effect, but all we know is that we stop here in our policy. In a more recent study, so that this group has been doing studies with these recruitment maneuvers for a while. So in 2012, this was published. This is six years after that other information where they have patients at baseline and then you can see they increase the PEEP to 20 and they use a pressure control of 15 centimeters of water, which is part of our policy. 
they increase the PEEP by 5, we start at 25. And then we go to 30, they went straight up to 35, and then right up to 45. They were going up to 60, whereas if we're going to 50, we'll go a little slower. So we usually go 25, 30, 35. And then what they did in this study is they actually went to 25 and did a CT scan. 20, did a CT scan. 15, did a CT scan. Does that sound like a fun day for you? <laughs> Even if you were waiting in the CT scan, like, yeah. So this is research. This is not practical. This is why, but what does this tell you? It tells you regional information, whether or not the patient is recruitable, partially recruitable. This is the information that they're gathering. And this is one of the purposes and one of the benefits to EIT that we're actually finding. And I'm going to give you a case example of us doing this and seeing what happens in the lung without having to do a CT scan. So that's what's cool. But this is our policy, right? 25 and 15, 30 and 15, 35 and 15. In terms of how long you do it, if I put an esophageal balloon in someone and I know their pleural pressures are close to 30, I might start here and I know I'm going to go to here, so I might only do that for 30 seconds. But I think in our policy it says one to two minutes if they tolerate it. So it's up to your comfort level. If I know I'm going to be up here, I might start here, maybe a couple of breaths, then turn it to here, and then I want to get this and I want to use this pressure for a longer period of time. And in the one example, we did this and she started to recruit and we just kind of left it there for about <coughs> 10 minutes. And I'll show you the results of that. <clears throat> we could have gone up higher, maybe got there quicker, but we lost so much ventilation just at that. We said, okay, we've lost ventilation, we're over distending, but we are recruiting, so let's just wait it out. And we waited it out. Rather than making the over distension worse, we just waited. So. This is a patient example of us doing a pressure control style recruitment. I didn't take a screenshot because I didn't have my USB stick, so I just took a picture with my phone. But you can see the increase in PEEP and increase, increase, so we're doing our maneuver. These images, this is the cursor baseline. This image is at the peak of our recruitment maneuver. This image is the difference between those two. Orange means you've lost ventilation, blue means you've gained. Did I really gain much? Exactly. Hence why this is very low potential or potentially a non-recruiter. I got a little bit, little bit here, but the potential is very, very low for recruitment. So this is a patient that I wouldn't continue to try recruitment maneuvers on. I'd say, yeah, we can do them, but they're not working. And that's going up to a high pressure. This is higher than just doing 30 for 30 or 40 for 40. This is like getting up to a PIP of 50 and it did nothing. Okay. This is an example of a PIP at 16. And this is a different use of that other screen. This is my reference shot. So this is before I go, or I mean before I do a maneuver, and this is right now. And this will, when I capture a screenshot, this doesn't represent, because it's moving constantly, so it might not show up very well, but this is showing the difference between right now and my reference. Peep of 16, this is an example of a non-recruiter. We go up to 20, nothing. We go up to 22. A whole lot of over distension, nothing popping open. So that's an example of us going up and nothing happening. So now I'll give you an example of people who are actually responding to recruitment maneuvers. So this is a lady, when we went from PEEP of 12 to 16, she was in room 23. We just went to the bedside, turned up the PEEP, and compliance got worse. And as you can see, the difference between our reference, and you can see where my problem ventilating is. So if you remember, this is like a CT slice, right? I usually give the example of you got a, a, a magician has a volunteer in a box and they do the saw. So we're looking from the feet towards the head. This is the saw maneuver there. So you're looking at right, left, ventral, dorsal. For some reason, right ventral zone, there's something in there that's preventing ventilation from occurring. She actually has reasonable dorsal region ventilation, but something's affecting the ventral, the right ventral side. So just increasing PEEP did nothing but stretch the area that's ventilating just fine. This is why her compliance went down. We put a balloon in her and found her pleural pressures to be 20. So we know that means we got to go to PEEP of 20. So first we did a recruitment maneuver and then went to 20. Now, after doing that, we're not over distending the area. Again, this is our reference. We've popped open this area and now we're ventilating it. And we left it on, this is at 11.11. We left it on her and this is at 4.04. So we left it on for a good uh, number of hours. And you can see how stable it was that it remained open for that period of time. So using the esophageal guided pressure, again, just standing at the bedside and playing around, we put the balloon in, we're like, okay, but when we put the balloon in, we went to 20, but 
The patient, interestingly enough, didn't improve immediately. SATs didn't go up immediately, tidal volumes didn't improve immediately, but EIT told us that it worked, so we left it. Whereas if you just go up and nothing magical happens, you can keep it up, but you're like, maybe it's safer to go down, I don't know. And that's one of the problems, not problems, but the limitations of esophageal pressure is that it's a catheter sitting right here. I have no idea where it's affecting my ventilation. We set the peep properly, but we don't know if it's popping anything open. So how many of you put a balloon in and it didn't make a difference after we turned the peep up or down? This told us that, yeah, this worked and it popped open. And it wasn't until about five hours later that we started weaning down her pressure control, weaning down her effort. Like it was very slow to occur. It wasn't this immediate uh, aha moment where the SATs just magically occurred, which I've seen before where we've adjusted PEEP and just SATs start getting better. It was a bit slower with her, but we could see how stable it was and how she got better over time. So taking take home points with her, increasing PEEP alone did not recruit the lung. It seemed only to worsen ventilation on the left side. <coughs> However, setting appropriate PEEP resulted in recruitment and sustained improvements over time and we were able to lower driving pressure from 20 to 16 and lower her FO2 requirements. So here is a case, post-op admission to ICU. This lady was in bed nine. She had a drainage of a subphrenic abscess. Her abdomen was less left open and she, because they saw some ischemic bowel. She went back two days later to remove 45 centimeters um, of bowel and then 72 hours post OR, just unstable. RT is constantly getting called to the, to the room for spontaneous desats. You'd get her settled. She'd be anywhere between 70 and 80% typically. On this day, she was on 60 and we we're like, okay, she's doing good. But you can see her PF ratio is not good. It's 108. We're like, that was like the best she had been. But they wanted to bronk her because they, we put EIT on. Oh, by the way, they had been doing some recruitment maneuvers, 35 for 30. I think the physician that was on just wanted, yeah. The physician that was on just wanted to play it safe. Um, and fair enough, some patients, if they're unstable, you don't know if they're going to tolerate it and you have no visual guidance, right? So we had visual guidance with her. So we threw it on. This is her baseline. So they bronked her because they wanted to see if we could open up, well, maybe, maybe there was something blocking her left dorsal region that they could then, you know, improve upon by bronking her. We did the recruitment maneuver. So this is PEEP at 12. We started turning up the PEEP. We tried something funky here. And this is the patient that I said, once we got to a PEEP at 25, we noticed it started to recruit. And we just said, okay, well, let's just wait a minute. Because if you look at the shape of this, see how it's going up? That means like the bottom part of this graph is going up. That means over time, your end expiratory lung impedance is actually improving, which means you're getting more and more volume in your lung at end exhalation. So as we increase the PEEP, you can see over time she recruited, but was I getting benefit everywhere? No, that orange means I've lost a ton of ventilation where I had ventilation, but I've gained where I didn't have it. So once we opened up, this was the result. But would I keep my patient on a PEEP of 25? I probably have more loss than gain, meaning I'm going to have maybe a little bit better oxygenation because I popped this open, but I'm not going to have better ventilation. So we dropped the PEEP down to 20 and gained back. So this is almost like that study. They went from recruitment and then down to 20. We gained back that area that we lost, but I didn't lose the area that I had gained. And see how round the image still is. And this white, by the way, is the maximum point of inspiration, which does not mean bad or good, but I usually make the joke that it's kind of like cream cheese on a bagel. You want it evenly spread. <coughs> you don't just want a big blob over on one side of it. So you want this to be relatively evenly, dis like evenly distributed, whereas prior it was just this big blotch of white up here. Now it's evenly distributing over here. We have more blue here, which we didn't have before, but the white hasn't quite distributed. So this was day one, and that was peep of 25 to 20. We looked at 20 over time to see if it was stable. So this is 20 over time. See how flat the bottom of that graph is? And I've put the cursor here, and then at the end, mm -hmm. and you can see I've got no loss. So 20 was stable. I went to 18. You see the orange? We lost ventilation to the dorsal region, so we re-recruited her and put it back to 20. By the end of the day, she was still on a high driving pressure. We had her PEEP at 20, and we were weaning her FO2 to 45, and her PF ratio was 100 higher by the end of the day. Day two, we went back in. I had this project with one of our students. Next day, went in, put the belt on again in the afternoon, and we dropped the PEEP from 20. We just did PEEP titration. Went in, went from 20 to 18. So dropping from 20 to 18, didn't lose any volume, okay? Now before I show you the next slide, what do you think happened when I dropped to 16 just by looking at the shape of the bottom of the curve? 
not the curve, sorry, the, the bar here, the graph here. See how it's sloping downwards? So when we dropped her to 16, we observed this, we observed that and, oh sorry, this is 18 over time. It seems a little bit of a slope, but it was stable. But once we got to 16, we noticed that we were losing dorsal region ventilation again. And, but you can visually see the slope. So that just means that over time, the PEEP is not stable enough to maintain your end expiratory lung volume. So it starts to go down and down and down. And then we lost, over time, lost ventilation to that area. So by this day, she's on a driving pressure of 14 now, PEEP of 18, FO2 of 35. Now her PF ratio is 351. No dis like they weren't called back to the room at all. The patient had 2.8 liters of fluid diurese over the next 24 hours, which is a lot. We've seen more and not had magical results, but for this lady, what happened next will... <laughs> you can't wait to see what happened next. So we put the belt on and we put it, by the way, in the exact same position every day because you can put a belt on someone like this and if you put it really low, it might look like that because the heart's here and you're just capturing the tip of the lungs, the dorsal regions. We put it in the exact same position every day. So we knew we were finding, our findings were just abnormal, different. And this is when we realized that when PEEP is too high, it just sticks up in the ventral zones. So this patient was breathing spontaneous now. So when they tell you to take a breath in, where's the air gonna go? It's not gonna go in the ventral regions because they have too much PEEP there. So it only ventilates in the dorsal regions. So we looked at that and we said, I think her PEEP is too high. And we did this PEEP titration next and it wasn't until after that I went to the nurse and I'm like, did anything, like what, anything happen in the next last 24 hours? Like, She's like, well, she, I'm like, she's on dialysis. Did we actually get fluid off? Oh yeah, like almost three liters. So I looked it up and it was 2.8 liters, which was more than double what she had gotten the, the days prior to that. So we reached that threshold where now fluid was impacting the ability for us to maintain an open lung. So we went from 18 all the way down to eight, just to save you the boring, going all the way down, no loss. And look, all I did is start gaining ventilation to that area. When we went to peep of six, then we started to lose a bit there, but we still gained. So to me, when I see just as much gain as I see loss, it could be a redistribution. We actually left her on six. Because we, we were just, we were shocked at how aggressively, by the way, this was in 30 minutes. I mean, how aggressive have you been peep? I would never go from 18 to six in one shift, ever. Now, we didn't, I would have loved to have a balloon in this lady, but this just showed us that we could be as aggressive at the bedside monitoring as we want to be with this and seeing the, the impact immediately. So ventilator settings by the end of that day, driving pressure of 14, PEEP 6, 30% and PF ratio still maintained at 373. And again, no desaturation episodes. So in summary, using multiple tools to monitor the patient will give you a big picture, but mostly the global picture, right? It doesn't tell us where problems are happening, are happening, but one tool does not provide every aspect of it. And of course, Using all these tools and especially using the it's just another monitor. We have ICU monitor. We have event monitor It's just another monitor. It's not something that's going to fix your patient You have to be willing to do something to your patient, but you have another monitor now It's like VCO2 once you start using that it's kind of cool It's another thing to monitor well now we can monitor ventilation in the lungs, which is really cool So there should be a paradigm shift away from generalized approaches to mechanical ventilation Which this line is more for the hospitals that I go and I give this talk to who aren't doing this, this is what we do here. We individualize patients. We've been using transpulmonary pressure. And this is just, again, another monitoring tool for us to do it.